we should solve human challenges. But I think not enough time is spent on maintenance and fixing what already there and was already wrong, especially when we come to the AI space. There's a lot of thinking about how to stop things from getting worse online through cybersecurity. I know we have a woman in cybersecurity network. Some of them are sitting in here, and which is a, a great thing for us to have. But I feel like we still need a voice of women in the space. Now, our main idea for us to sit here was um, I looked at the submissions of the Global Compact and when they were doing the online survey and who was submitting. And I felt the voice of the women was there. So I'm going to read a little bit about what the Global Digital Compact is. It's that following the political declaration adopted at the occasion of the United Nations 75th anniversary in September 2020, the Secretary General in September 2021 released his report, Our Common Agenda. The Common Agenda proposed a global digital compact to be agreed at the summit of the future in September 2023 through a technology track involving all stakeholders, governments, the United Nations system, the private sector, including tech companies, civil society, grassroots organizations, academia, individuals, including youth. But if you look at what's being submitted towards this, we still don't have enough voice of a woman. So I felt like we need a room where all women will be able to contribute from their own ex perspective, lived experiences, and knowledge on what they think should be included in the final Global Digital Compact. And hopefully our voices will be heard through IGF in the summit in 2023. So as the Global Digital Compact is is expected to outline shared principle for an open, free, and secure digital future for all. We all know that at the moment, um, inclusion, diversity, and equity for women and girls is something far-fetched, especially in Africa. I'm not going to deviate around that. There isn't enough internet. Women are the ones who are not more on internet. And issues of including like digital connectivity, avoiding internet fra fragmentation, providing people with options as to how their data is used, application of human rights online, and promoting a trustworthy internet by introducing accountability criteria for discriminating and misleading content will be discussed. And we need a voice of women from their own perspective. And I think this room is meant for that. So we're overdue. I'm going to start giving the overview of who is IGF for those, thanks to the um, UN Secretariat that sponsored most of the women to be here, who applied through a proposal to be here and really contribute. These are women who are leaders in their own communities, and they really are going to add a lot of value into this. So they are part of the panels and speaker line. And so I will hand over to the people who are going to give us the overview of the politics of IGF, the representation, and what it means for the institution, the way it looks like. So our first speaker would be Anya, and then after that it will be Magda. Over to you, Anya. Thank you very much, Paratang. Um, Yes, indeed, uh, you are right. In terms of the women empowerment, in terms of the solving the gender-based digital divide, those topics are a priority for the IGF. They have been so for several years back, and certainly they are a subject of uh, our priority of this year's IGF. Uh, throughout the teams, you may not see the terms inclusion or um, connectivity, especially for women and girls and so on. But if you look at the narratives across the five main themes of the IGF, then you will see that the concept of gender inclusion, of women inclusion especially, is extremely important cross-cutting all five teams, including the overarching teams. At this year's IGF, there are around, uh, well, over 300 sessions, including this day zero. If you look across those sessions, then you will see that the number of sessions a really large number of sessions relate to uh, 
focusing on these types of topics. And even if they're not, if you look at the, as I said, narratives of each session, then you will see that the women inclusion, girls inclusion, is something that's extremely important for each type of topic. And I'm glad that Baratang was mentioning at the beginning different sections that we will tackle during this session, because they are very, very important if you speak about cyber, cyber security, just safety online, but also if you speak about connectivity and access, uh, only because uh, women and girls are still um, alarmingly vul vulnerable and marginalized groups in so many parts of the world, and we are very much unequal when it comes about the opportunities that we have online. So, for example, today, the, this, these condition, conditions that we have makes us very privileged compared to those that unfortunately are not able to even connect, or even if they're connected, they're not able to use um, the internet and all its services and tools that it provides. In addition to that, I want to say that um, the IGF's focus on um, gender overall topics um, has been also subject of um, its intercessional work. So there is a best practice forum on gender and digital rights that's been running for several years now. This year, uh, specifically, it was looking at into court practices, into jurisdictional uh, domain, and how it reflects to the um, inclusion of women and girls in that area. The intersectional work in that forum means that different stakeholders are gathered uh, to discuss these topics, to bring good practices into the international arena and exchange them, but also to um, point uh, what is not so good and what needs to be changed so we don't repeat mistakes that others already repeated. And finally, I want to say that uh, there's a specific segment of um, digital, gender-based digital divide and gender inclusion in the policy network on meaningful access the IGF has been facilitating for two years. Uh, it's also part of the intersectional work, which very much, much puts emphasis on um, the ways, um, on the causes of the issue, uh, and then um, advises on the possible next steps and recommendations, how can we bring progress on the identified issues. In terms of access and inclusion, connectivity, the policy network on meaningful access has been identifying, so for two years now, um, the fact that uh, women and girls are very much underrepresented when it comes about these types of processes, just discussion processes, uh, not to speak about the mere fact uh, on the accessibility and affordability of just the internet, digital tools and services to them. Um, and finally, I want to just speak a little bit about the process and how that's important. In terms of the IGF, uh, as you know, in the structure, um, gender parity is something that is a goal of certain structural processes. And I certainly refer to, for example, the composition of the multi-stakeholder advisory group, which uh, is um, critical when it comes to the program of each uh, IGF annually speaking. The MAG is composed of 40 members, and there's a gender parity across the 40 members. Uh, soon, at this year's IGF, we will listen about the appointment of the 2023 MAG. So one, approximately one-third of the membership will be appointed to plan the meeting for next year for Japan. And certainly, gender parity there will be one of the goals uh, to achieve on the overall composition. Likewise, if you look at the, uh, this year's IGF, if you look at the panels, one of the key criteria that the MAG applied was uh, gender balance on each panel. But not just on panel. It's important that in um, designing everything that's going to be presented through panel, we have meaningfully uh, included women and girls, just as men and other uh, gender diverse, diverse groups. And so that's, that's something that I think we can take note of for our processes as well, that it's not about just about the substance, it's also about the process and the fact that we all have to be recognized as equals. Uh, one of the ways to do that, uh, I think, uh, is um, sessions like this, to raise awareness, to point that th these types of practices do exist in the world, that we can learn from good practices, and also to become aware that problems of this nature exist. There are so many processes, especially on decision-making level, which unfortunately do not include in a meaningful way women and girls, and I think that needs to be changed. The change starts from these types of dialogues, and I hope that by 5 p.m., as Baratang said during our discussions, 
a change may be also achieved in some processes in, in this regard. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Anya. Um, now that we are going to our second speaker, Magda from UNECA. Thank you. Thank you for inviting UNECA to be part of this uh, gender summit. But the problem we have, uh, we are we are few men here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I must I must thank you because I re it took so many WhatsApp messages to cancel everything that you were doing and give us three hours. I really, ladies, we have to give Magda a left. She was fully booked. Yeah. <laughs> but he said for women in IGF, I will definitely be there and I'll be there for the whole session. So thank I, you. I will be there, but I need the gift at the end of the. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's a very, very important meeting. I think, uh, woman, uh, when we look at the situation in Africa, 50.1% 50 of the African population are women. And we, when we translate on the digital connectivity, there is a, a huge digital gender gap in the continent. The women represent more 51%, and access on the in Internet, they represent only 20%. It is, a, it is something we have to think about. And this issue is happening since a uh, uh, long time. And when, when we look at the global world, uh, there is some uh, uh, quite good progress because uh, for at the end of 21, 2001, 6, 6, 70% of the men are, have access to internet compared to 40, 47% to, to women. The difference is not in our menu, but when you come to Africa, the difference is a huge. And also, if I uh, go to other sector, look at the percentage of women on the ICT sector. Hmm? Very few. Hmm? Around 12%. Very few women in the ICT sector. And this, also, this, is, this is due to, to several factors. We have a cultural factor also we have to take into consideration because uh, for the capacity skill development, when, it, when you go to several countries, women are not allowed to go to school. No. It, is a, it is something we have to look at is our, our culture. And also, uh, in several countries, we, uh, women doesn't have equal chance to the, to the men to access to several uh, jobs. And uh, there, are, there are several studies around the world. Hmm? to show if we can uh, sort it out this gender equality. Hmm? Hmm? We can cap, come up with uh, 12, uh, 3 million dollars hmm? to the global GDP. It is show uh, the importance of women in the development of the world. Without women, we can't develop the country. We talk about this digi Africa digital, th digital, digital transformation strategy. We talk about uh, a IGF, a digital incl inclusion or inclusion of the woman. We can talk about which is all initiative we have in the world. Huh? And without woman, is not successful. I remember when we start uh, the WISIS um, uh, and IGF, uh, we don't have a lot of women. Now, I think the majority are women. It seems that there is a very important step uh, taken by the woman to be part of this uh, digital era. At uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, Empowering women is very important. It's part of our key program at the ECA. And we have a, a digital center called Digital Center of Excellence on Digital ID, Digital Threat, Digital Economy. One of the focus area is uh, empowering women. And how we do like that? Why, 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 how we do in the program? First, uh, when you look at the composition of the digital center, we have more women than men. We have few men in our center. A lot of our women. Eh? Second, we have uh, two key program, very important program for women. The first is the Africa Connected Girl Coding Camp. We started this program in 2020. Now the program is reached in four in six country: uh, Ethiopia, uh, Cameroon, uh, Senegal, uh, Guinea, Tanzania, and uh, Namibia. As of today. We have trained around 25,000 girls on, 
uh, on artificial intelligence, web gaming, uh, on uh, Internet of Things, uh, on how to use digital technology in the climate change, how to use digital technology in health, how to use digital technology in the social environment. And as of today, we have around 242 projects developed by this younger age between 12 years and 25 years. And uh, you found great initiative developed by, by, by this young girl. This just show there are a lot of ideas among this girl. I can give you an example. There are some uh, girls who develop one project on, on the health maternity. Yeah. And this girl never use uh, digital technology, but we give them uh, this tool to, during one week, and they come up to develop this kind of project. Also, there are a lot of projects regarding their environment, or when the girl come in the city, the problems they are facing. And all this, uh, they develop a website and way gaming based on that. It is a very important program at UNECA. And uh, we, uh, we, the next coding camp will be held in Niger. And by uh, 2025, uh, 20, uh, we expect to train 100,000 girls around the continent. And among this 100,000 girls, 10 percent, uh, our objective is uh, that 10 percent of these girls trained will focus uh, on the key, on the ICT sector. Yeah, they, they found a job in the ICT sector, 10%. And 40%, because they are young, will continue their study on the ICT sector. It is a pleasure we have, we are, uh, and we get, we can uh, do more, I think, with the involvement of uh, all girl here and women and girl here, we can uh, do more uh, for this uh, young girl. Another program, it is uh, what call is te uh, technology, uh, wait, let me, the, the right word, the, the African woman uh, technology, African woman technology, Tech Africa Woman Initiative, we'll call it TAU. It is a program we, we launched this year in collaboration with uh, Beta Kibu. And uh, this uh, program's objective is to place a strong emphasis on the community and network, focus on uh, a woman startup, only the woman startup. And uh, this program uh, will uh, we reach now in uh, four countries uh, this year, and we target by 2005 uh, to, uh, to, to access uh, to 50 countries in the continent. Next year, the program will cover 16 new countries, if uh, you are interested by this uh, program, we have a focal point on the room. I see a focal point you can uh, uh, discuss and we'll uh, put your country in this program because we build the capacity of the women startup hmm, by providing also some incentive and some fund to, uh, to improve their, their business. It is a very interesting program. We started in uh, uh, Tunisia, uh, Senegal, uh, uh, Namib Na 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 Namibia, and uh, there is another country, four countries, and uh, the, now is there are 385 uh, women startup um, under this program, and this, this lady take again support from uh, UNECA. I don't want to be very long for that, but just I uh, call upon everybody to take into consideration the importance of women in all areas. In the policy side, when we design this uh, uh, policy, we should take into consideration the involvement of, of women on this policy. How we can do make better hmm, to the participation of the woman on the, so on the society. We talk about digital society, but we can expand to all society. We need women everywhere in the digital technology. We need the women in agriculture. We need women in, in science. We need women in uh, health. We need women in administration, in the economy. We need women everywhere. And we, when we look at Africa, the, eco, the, the informal sector of Africa is based, the, the more important part of the informal sector in Africa uh, is represented by the woman. I think uh, ev everybody knows uh, there is a woman who wake up early in the morning to go to the market. Huh? 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 They go to the market to, to buy, to sell, and when they come, they, they provide food to their, uh, uh, their kids. It is something I think we have to, we have to take to, into consideration. And uh, also, generally, the men are not at home, hmm? and, and the education is handled by the woman. Hmm? If uh, people uh, get success on this in uh, his work and is this future, it's because there is a woman behind. I think we have to take in consideration and put a woman at the top.
and what we are doing at ECA. And personally, I believe that uh, women it will, should be at the top of the society. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mata. I am now thinking you, you touched on three things that really brought all of us together here. And I think everybody else here took notes. You talked about skills, employment, leadership, and then what the UNCA is doing. And you touched on one project that I think I'm interested. It's called Tech Africa Women. It's for women starters. Women who are sitting here, if you missed the word, it's called Tech Africa Women. You can Google it. They wanna re this year they reached 25,000 women in the continent. Next year they are increasing the number. That's very good. I think that's, we need another clap for that. Um, the next speaker is Sister Jandi. I've met and listened to her speak many times, and I was very impressed by how she touched on, you know, we live in a world that exists with so many dynamics of power, and the patriarchy has been around for generations, generations and generations. So I thought we should bring another dimension, because as women, we all believe in something. And we always, when we talk about policies and when you talk about certain things, we always have an alignment of our beliefs and what the society have told us. So Sister Jant will be joining us online, and she will be speaking about power dynamics, politics, economics, and policy, and how the three are interlinked. I, I can't see because I'm now offline all of a sudden. Um, she can... Can she join if anybody is able to send a message and say she can join? Um, Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, we're not getting the video through, but at least you can hear me, and that's important. Um, Bharatang, thank you so much for this invitation to this very important forum. And yes, I do believe that life is interlinked in so many different ways. Our policies, our systems, all of them are geared very much to a patriarchal society, and I want to remind you of an expression that is used in China. And the expression goes something like this, that women hold up half the sky. And I believe that that is absolutely a fact. And also, I want to touch upon something that our former esteemed speaker mentioned, and that is the subject of education of women. And they say that if you teach a boy, you teach one individual, but if you teach a girl, you actually teach a whole village because her connections are with the whole village. And so I do feel that it's a very, very important forum that has come together. But I also know that before you can start changing policies, you need to have women as part of the people who are actually creating the policies. And when you think about the economics, then again, it's so important to have women to have an equal chance. And even in the so-called developed world, we still see that there's a glass ceiling when it comes to the corporate sector. And so all of these things are very definitely interlinked. And I would like to share something very specifically in which I want to say that the starting point has to be women having confidence and self-esteem in themselves. And so I think that that really is the crux of the story. And so how do we do that? Um, society, not just today, but for millennia, has told women that they're second-rate citizens and unfortunately, if you keep hearing the same message being repeated to you again and again, especially in the formative years of childhood or even infancy, and if at every step along the way, 
It's the boy who's given the extra portion or the only portion of food, or if it's only the boy who's given all opportunity and the girl is told, well, it doesn't matter, you're only a girl. Then, of course, this self-image that's created is that of a second-class citizen. And women just don't then have the confidence or the self-esteem or the value of the self to be able to move forward. And so I would suggest that starting right from an early age, but also all the way through the generations, if we can create this consciousness, this awareness within women, that every single individual, every human being has value and is important. I'm not even saying that women are more important than men, not at all. We have to work together. Remember the story of the sky? 50% is held up by women, but equally 50% is held up by men. And so it's really a story and narrative that has to change through the generations and both genders. And in fact, I believe that this situation of awareness of the inner being, not just my physical gender or even my nationality or my religion, but I believe that the understanding of who I am as a human being, as an individual, is of vital importance. And across the world, with materialism coming in, consumerism coming in, we also have forgotten that we are spirit, not just matter. And so, yes, this body has a gender, but the inner being, the spirit, doesn't have gender. In fact, it has both qualifications, the qualities of the feminine and the qualities of the masculine, which makes for a perfect balance. Because yes, you can have courage and conviction and power and authority as the masculine qualities, but you also need the qualities of compassion, of kindness, of fair play, of justice, which are inherently there within the woman. So the feminine qualities are absolutely, and the masculine qualities, both qualities come together to make up a balanced human being. But also I think that another thing that we've been struggling with for a long time has been the whole subject of inferiority and superiority complexes. And may I say that I think this also applies across the gender. Oh, because if I think I am superior and I try to push down somebody, well, there'll be somebody who is my superior. And at that moment, I will feel inferior. And so these sorts of complexes that human beings go through actually apply to both genders. But today, looking at the subject of women's equality and the opportunity to come into roles of leadership so that they can be there to create policies so that women have the opportunity to participate in an equal share within the economic climate of country, I think that women especially have been told, you are less than others, you are inferior. And I know that Africa is a, country, is a continent that has a lot of love for the divine and has a lot of love on the focus of spirit. And so I want to bring in that, that we are the creation of that source, the being up above. And as such, as the creation, we were created in the image of the divine. And so there is no question of inferior or superior. In fact, all of us have been created in that image, which means that each and every human being has love, truth, joy, purity, and also wisdom and peace. These are the essential ingredients of every human being. And I think what we need to do is to make people more aware of spirit. Yes, we're in a world of technology, but technology is a tool. And it's our awareness and consciousness 
that enables us to either use tools in the right way and in an appropriate way or to misuse and abuse tools. And we have enough evidence of this. So what is the consciousness with which we approach technology? That's important. If I if I tap into my own inner reserves of my own goodness and compassion, then I'm going to use all the things that are available to me in the best possible way for the maximum benefit of all around me. I believe women have a natural inclination to share. Have you ever seen a woman say, no, I want to eat first and then I feed my kids? I've never seen that. And so always there's a spirit of giving, spirit of sharing. And so when I tap into that inner compassion and goodness, then the technology that I have is something that I'm going to share with others also. I want to give you the example of the Brahma Kumaris. The Brahma Kumaris started in 1937. And in order to bring about parity, um, the founder decided that there should be affirmative action. Until today, we still have women in roles of leadership and the majority of teachers are women. And when the founder passed away, there were two women who were given responsibility. And believe me, the two created a larger group of leadership and that leadership continued with unity and harmony up until today. And so may it continue forever. But that's my point, that when there are women leaders, they don't just keep it to themselves. They want to share with others also, give others that opportunity. So women in decisions of policy are highly, highly capable of involving others and bring them up to that point where there can be shared decision making. Women also then have that flair for running a home, their budget, the economy. And I believe that women being able to manage things and make sure that everybody has an equal share, not just one part of the family. Again, they have that instinct for what is justice and what is fair play, and they would be able to bring that into play also. But I think that the most important thing is to come back and highlight this awareness that we are all spirit. Yes, we have a human body. And yes, we're spiritual beings on a human journey. So we don't have to search for spirit. We are spirit. And when we come in that awareness, then this consciousness and this awareness can truly create a better Africa for all those who live within it, but also a better Africa means a better world because the contribution of Africa will then be something which is really, truly for the whole wide world. So I'm very hopeful that including this very important subject of gender equality is going to bring very quick results and move things forward in a very powerful and positive way for everyone. So much appreciation for what you're doing, Baratang, and everybody else with you, but also my deep, deep thanks and greetings of peace. Om Shanti. Thank you very much, Sister Shanti. Unfortunately, I'm not going to take questions for the speakers because we're all running out of time. We left, we lost 20 minutes in the beginning. So I'm going to go straight to the next session. And I will start, unless there's a burning question for Magda and Anya, because they come from UN and UNDESA. Okay, none. And I'll move on to the next session. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be um, the co-organizer of the session of women in IGF, um, Margaret Nyambura. So she will take over and talk about what Prida is doing um, and the training that they've done across Africa, which is amazing, and what they look for when they think of how to look at policies. Thank you, Baratang. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it was amazing, actually, listening to the to Dianti. 
uh, when she talked about building confidence to young women when they are growing up, and myself as a mother of a triplet who are seven, eight, years here, eight years now, and one of them is a boy, who I have no idea where he gets the knowledge that he should control the remote, he should be, uh, <laughs> when it comes to devices, issues of access and affordability, they are really in my household because uh, we only have one device. And with that device, she con he controls the programs to be watched, always in the middle of the girls to ensure that he has full control. So I think that these are cultural issues that we have to address them from the world go. And it's a challenge for me, and I know it's a challenge for most of us who have young kids in this digital age. And we must ensure that that confidence is built, that the girls themselves, they can also grab that device and take control of it. They, they can also control the remote, because I think this division, this iniquity, they start from that particular point. So going back to what I'm supposed to be talking about, I'm working for a project called Policy and Regulation Initiative for Digital Africa. It's a project of the African Union where we uh, it has three tracks, but my focus will be on what we are doing, trying to bring more women in the digital space, trying to organize training through the School of Internet Governance, where we are focusing on various issues, including cybersecurity, including uh, economic aspects of uh, digital space, all the aspects, the seven baskets that have been developed by Diplo. And uh, what we have been doing uh, deliberately is to ensure that when we are recruiting the participants, we do 50-50%. <laughs> But that has been a challenge, I must say, uh, because we do advertisement uh, across all the platforms. But you find women, we don't apply. I have no idea what the reason is. Probably it is a fear of the cause or the time or the commitment. Because as much as we try to say advertise through the women networks and the like, we get low application from women. And as a result, so far we have trained 1,500 uh, people across the continent, and out of these, 25% are women. But the positive part of it is that the women who start this training, they complete. We have less women who enroll into the training, but the completion rate when it comes to women is very good. So again, it shows commitment that once we start doing something, we focus up to the end, and that is a good quality that, uh, that I think we should take forward. Uh, probably another thing I want to say uh, in my other hat that I sit in the African Women Cybersecurity uh, Expert Group as an observer, and again, in there, there's a lot that is happening in terms of women uh, uh, cybersecurity measures, norms, CBMs, and the like, and again, we don't have women there where, again, those issues, as uh, Makta said, we spent a lot of time with the children, and the digital gadgets have become the toys, and online YouTube and the like. If we are not aware what they are watching, what they are doing in that digital space, how are we going to model them? How are we going to ensure that our cultures, our traditions, they are maintained? As much as we want to integrate what is happening from the other parts of the world, I think it is important that we ensure that we take control of what is happening in our households. And uh, therefore, and again, it was said in terms of capacity building, while we are going out to look for women, I think we have to deliberately go to schools, teachers. If you go to lower primary schools, most of the teachers there, they are women. And that's where probably, again, we need to focus on capacity building when it comes to digital skills. Because these are the people who are dealing with our children. They are the ones who are with our kids all the time. We need to ensure we give them the confidence that uh, yeah, Jayati talked about. If you, if you are not confident with these devices, then that means you will not use them, and you not even bother what your children are doing with it. And when it comes to the curriculum, you are not even keen to ensure that they are integrated because you don't know what it is all about. So basically, I think we have to start it there to ensure that we change the statistics we are talking now. Because again, if you don't do anything now, 20 years down the line, you'll be saying in our computer school classes, we have 10% of women. When it comes to data science, it's 10% because we didn't do anything 10 years, 30 years back. So this is a time to do something so that 30 years to come, then we are talking of different dynamics. So another work I'm doing, uh, there's a network called Network of African Women in Cybersecurity. Again, this was created uh, to address the issues of women not being in the digital space. And this is a continental network. Uh, Ten women came together. We realized we need to start something so that we have um, 
uh, coordination ac uh, across the continent. We are able to, first of all, mentor women at various levels. We are able to work with the government, civil society to influence policies at that level. We are also able to, um, to develop um, webinars that we are integrating with women. And we, we have men actually in that group and MACTA. Who is here is one of our man, uh, of our man ally. We also have uh, our former director at African Union Commission, uh, Mokta. He's now a minister in uh, Mauritania. And again, when you have that kind of uh, leadership, uh, people who are willing to help, and if we start with one country to integrate all these things, then you'll be able to move forward. I think for now, uh, those will be my interventions. Thank you. Um, to wrap up this session, I will open the floor to Adama. Adama served on MEC, so she listened to all the speakers that has been speaking about what is happening. So she will tell you what is MEC and why it exists and how when calls come through, we should all be involved in making sure that that representation continues. Um, I'll hand over to you, Adama. Um, thank you, Beretan, and um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a bit impromptu that I am speaking here today, considering I'm just notified today. <laughs> um, my colleagues should have been here, Mary or Henriette, but um, I'm hoping to be a good replacement. Um, so, talking about the MAC, I would like to, along the way, to shift the focus a little bit of the MAC and more on the grassroots level. And um, considering the MAC um, agenda is using a bottom-up approach. Um, the MAC is just a multi-stakeholder advisory group representing the academia, representing the private sector, the technical group, and the government, and um, the civil society, and now the parliamentarian, which is a, a huge step towards actually um, trying to get the informed discussions that we do during the forums being heard and being listened to and implemented uh, within our policies through the government and through the parliamentary, parliamentary um, um, policies and decision making. Um, Speaking of the MAG, um, I've served for the MAG from, the, from 2018 to 2020, 2020, being the first, Gam the first Gambian and a female to join the MAG. Joining the MAG, I was very inexperienced within the IGF space, but um, it was a good challenge. And then um, it put me in a position where I could actually listen to high-level discussions informed discussions on internet governance when it comes to inclusion. And gender being um, a topic that I hold dear to my heart, um, it, it, it's a place that we can um, seek representation and then have our voices heard. But uh, going back to what I have been saying, the MAC is just a committee that assists, with the, assists the, the IGF, which is under the UN Secretary General's office, to, um, to, to organize the, the, the programs and then the, the workshops and also sort of look at um, the proposals that are sent in by the larger community um, from the different stakeholders and, and, and then from the different regions and, and globally. So um, just to um, bring the focus of women and then the involvement of women into um, the IGF space and where we, are dis where we discuss relevant issues or pre prevailing emerging issues um, that actually affects us as women and get it heard by the right people, the right sectors, and then the policy makers that can um, reflect the change or see the change that we want uh, when it comes to internet governance and digital internet and everything that evolves around it. Um, usually with the MAG, um, every year, the global IGF that we're having here, there is a call for um, proposal, call for sessions. And these are things that are very crucial, but at times we um, lose focus. It's not just about being here today, but it's about having the right discussions that actually reflects on the issues that are, happen that are affecting us, especially when it comes to women. Call for proposals, usually during my tenure, I've realized that we, especially from the African groups, we are not really informed on what are the issues that we need to address and how we go about doing these proposals when it comes to drafting them and sending it to the mark for evaluations because 
these are, evalu these are sessions that are evaluated by the MAC. We have thousands and thousands of proposals that are sent in every year to, for sessions, for discussions in the forums, but not all of them make it. Sometimes it's just up to 200 um, sessions that we have. But we don't, some of the main issues that are very like, relevant to us are not part of the sessions that are, uh, that are chosen because either we are not doing, we are not technically aware of how to do these proposals or we don't know the, the informed way. We are not using the right stakeholders or the gender parity in when we are selecting our speakers that are going to um, talk about this, this, this information or so these um, issues that we want addressed during these forums. So it's good to always as Africa to, when there is a call for proposal, let us be out there to actually send in the proposals. Let people know the issues that are happening, especially coming from the grassroots level. I'll come back to the grassroots level because this is something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, we talk about women for Africa. We have like 40% 40 40 of women are, have access to internet or are digitally connected. And even when we talk about digitally connected, there is a pending issue, which is meaningful connectivity. Because then we might be connected, but how is the connectivity improving anything when it comes to our social or economic development? We, is it just we are connected to just go on Facebook? Right? But no. How about when we talk about women in agriculture? How are they involved? How are they incorporated in the digital space? How, are, how can they use platforms on the internet in terms of e-commerce? I'll take Gambia as an example. We have most of the women that are 60% uh, of agriculture are done by women. But locally, most of the women don't even know, are not, I mean, educated enough or don't have access to internet because they are at the remote areas where you can find internet. But what can we do as a society or what can we do as advocates or how can we get the government to really look back at these people and say, okay, these are relevant stakeholders, that if we bring them on board and they are digitally included, then they can have, there will be a meaningful impact when it comes to the social and the, the economic um, development. Because we have them doing all the local farming, the agricultural product, our day to day sustainable, uh, sustainability when it comes to food and all that, are done by these women. But the marketing is not there when it comes to digital. And then the part is, digital transformation. So we have to look back and see how do we reach by a grassroots level to sort of incorporate, to integrate these people, to connect the unconnected and, and, uh, um, and get them on board. Let, when, we talk to, when we talk about inclusion, it should be decentralized and not centralized. Um, thank you, I'll not take more of your time, um, but uh, over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Adaman. You know, as you were speaking, I, I had this thing all, always open in front of me <coughs> because I have to read it so that I can sound intelligent when I speak sometimes. So I'm going to read it as is because you really touched on what the Secretary General of the United, States, United Nations said. So I'm reading a quote. A safe, inclusive, and equitable digital future is essential for progress and peace. And Sister Janti talked on peace. And immediately after that, you, Margaret spoke about young women and girls and how they should be included. And you spoke about um, the involvement of the people in the tech and the decisions that are going to come out of that. So for me, it's very important that there's the roadmap for digital cooperation, ladies, there's always calls to participate. If we do not participate, if I get something right out of this meeting, is to say, as women, we need to go there, answer that survey, and participate and get our voices to be heard. So the biggest achievement for us out of this meeting is to say, as the Women Tech Policy Hub, we should have a voice and we should submit towards this. Because there's wide-ranging, I'm still reading what he said. He said, the roadmap for digital cooperation that I launched in 2020 offers a vision for a digitally interdependent world that connects, respects, and protects all people, in which all can thrive, and in which digital to tools do not cause harm 
or reinforce inequalities, but instead are a force for good. To be very honest, I think he was thinking about women, girls, and gender issues, and the people that are really marginalized, because at the moment, tech favors a certain group of people. And we need to involve that, because Magda mentioned earlier on that women don't use the internet. I think you said 40, if you can remind me the stats again, only 40% 40, 40 of tech is used by women, if I'm correct. So they, those are things, those are serious issues. You know, when we sit and we say women and girls, some people have closed their ears already. They don't hear because it's like you're telling a story every day. And what's so special about women and girls? But reality is 10, 15 years down the line, when we look back into humanity, our human consciousness, that thing that makes us human beings, will be taken over by AI. And it doesn't know what is a human woman. It doesn't give a damn about your gender. And if we do not correct it now and add perspective of a woman's voice now, that is something we'll miss for the rest of our life. The new world will come and build a better one. But this one that we live in, we are losing it. And so I'm going to hand over to Zanyue, who's going to start a new exciting session on technology and justice. So she'll be our first speaker, and then I'll... Hand over to you, Zanyue Asare. Zanyue is one of the organizers of the whole IGF as it is now in Addis. So it's an honor to have her sitting next to me. Thank you, Zanyue. Thank you so much for the kind words, Baratang. Uh, Baratang is very generous when it comes to me, so next time you hear her, you must take it at the pinch of salt. <laughs> uh, my name is Advocate Zanyue Taticia Sare, and I am the CEO of Digitally Legal, a digital laws, technology, and training consultancy based in South Africa and Zambia. I am also part of the UNECA task force that, as Baratang had, had said, uh, part of the organizing committee, and I thank you all for being here. Um, the tonight is amazing. So I will start with this session, um, which I was tasked to speak about technology, innovation, and justice, um, which was a difficult one, right? Uh, when, when we started, when we unpacked this with Baratang, I was asking, you want to speak about the, the justice system, or do you want to talk about um, uh, you know, technology that is being used by legal practitioners? And she said, just go with it. So this is me just going with it. So please do bear with me. So I think by definition, if we look at uh, technology innovation, um, this would really refer to improvements in the technology we have, the different processes that um, are continuously being developed. And I think all in all, we could just summarize this as technological development. Then when we speak about justice, um, justice would be, I think, fluidly defined as what is lawful, um, equity, what is fair, what is right, um, peace, human dignity, you know, the things that we know are right, the things that we perceive as just, um, that encompass respect and protection, um, protection measures that are offered typically by the law. So why do we need regulation or justice in the cyberspace, but more specifically, why do we need um, justice for technology and innovation? Bertang actually raised something really important, which I'll touch on shortly. I think it goes without saying that technology has really infused itself in each part of all of our lives here. I mean, the fact that I'm seeing myself on a screen and people are listening to all of us here and our inputs and opinions um, is testament to that. But I think, you know, a lot of the times you do have these discussions where we say this is just for the elite, but it's not. Even the remotest village dweller has felt the impact of um, technology and innovation. So for instance, if we look at mobile money, if we look at how they have new farmers markets that are coming up, their technology is really ut is being utilized to help um, you know, marginalized people in villages to connect with the rest of the world, we can see that this is a real thing that is affecting every single person and everybody. If we look at homes, you know, sci-fi movies are looking more normal. We've got Alexa and Siri helping us do this and that. We've got all sorts happening. From a telehealth perspective, we know that, you know, during the heart of the pandemic, people were being assisted where traditional measures were typically not, um, not available for us to use. So all of these areas, really, if you think about them in a physical sense, going to the doctor, going to the physical bank, etc., these are areas that have been regulated. 
But if we look at the cyber equivalent, these are areas that are largely not regulated. If you look at some of the crimes that happen, people will say, well, I went to the police station and they don't really know what to do because this happened in the cyberspace. So if we look at tech innovation and we look at justice, you can see that there's a really massive gap there where we really need to fill in. So comparatively speaking, we can say that the tech space has gone unregulated or ungoverned, and then we can say that the physical space does have what we can say, um, we can say it affords people a sense of safety, because I think it would also be remiss of me to say we live in a safe world. <coughs> the more technology advances, the more traditional roles become obsolete, meaning less physical world-based interventions, and um, this means offenses from both a civil and criminal perspective occur online, um, which don't really give us much of um, a solution. The lack of justice promotes behaviors that we would normally all frown, upon, uh, frown upon, um, and would be prejudicial. And I think as women sitting in this room, there are specific crimes that we know, yes, a man can endure, but as women, it actually impairs our dignity more severely than it would any man. For instance, if we look at hate speech on platforms, the limit, um, this limits the ability of women to participate because we know that in more traditional societies, when women do speak out, they can actually find themselves wanting and even get themselves killed in their communities. And a lot of the times we don't put those two things together, we speak about it in silos. We can speak about you know, safety and accountability for online platforms, elections, voting, etc., where you know, we know even in the physical world, it's been proven that people die from elections and politics. Now put that in a cyber world where you can actually get information if you breach certain platforms, if you get information that has been leaked. We can speak about artificial intelligence and machine learning, as Baratang had spoken about, where there's algorithmic biases that can really prejudice you know, women, people of the LGBTQI communities, where this can impact access to, fin to finance, um, to opportunities, to schools, to entrance, um, uh, to, to bursaries, etc. But I think one that has really been very topical that I've been working on quite a bit um, over the past couple of months is revenge porn. And looking at how this really impairs the dignity of you know, women in high positions, young girls, this can literally change the trajectory of lives and has also like, been part of um, the contribution to the scourge in suicide. A simple example of how technology needs to work, or rather justice needs to work alongside technological innovations is looking at the simple definitions within our legislation. So for instance, the word revenge porn itself is denoted or comes from um, the concept of you being in an intimate partner relationship and your intimate partner sending these images to someone to either you know, hurt you or impair your, your dignity or to, to make you feel psychologically harmed. However, we've seen that in the world that we live in, people are doing this to extort women. People are doing this to embarrass you. People are doing this when they haven't actually been in an intimate relationship with you. Maybe you talk too much on social media. Maybe you're too much of a feminazi in their eyes. People are doing this to silence women. And the legislation itself needs to look at changing the words so it encompasses it easily without having to overinterpret or overanalyze statute. So I think I'm not going to talk too much on this because I am going to chair this session. Um, but you know we have various crimes um, or cyber crimes acts, data protection acts, video and film content acts, acts that speak about this. But a lot of them, and a lot of the times they work in silos, and a lot of the times the biggest issues there are legislative, uh, jurisdiction-based issues where. If this crime happens to you sitting in Ethiopia, or you feel in Ethiopia, you go to the Ethiopian authorities, but the person is sitting in Canada. What do you do about that? So I'll give you a brief example of what's happening in South Africa. So in December, on the 1st of December 2021, in South Africa, Section 20 of the Cyber Crimes Act was put into action. And this really helps legal practitioners, the courts, the magistrates, look at um, the IP addresses as something that can be submitted to help you look at where this particular crime happens. So for instance, let's say a social media platform. It now compels social media platforms to give you the information of that particular individual, because a lot of the times you're fighting ghosts when you work in the cyberspace. So those are the kind of you know, um, uh, justice uh, keeping power with innovation that we're talking about to say, one, we're women. Let's talk about our lived out experiences. Let, let's look at the definitions and the legislations. Let's talk about how this needs to be tweaked according to the real things that we actually experience as opposed to what other people want to write on our behalf. We've got a voice. 
So I'm going to skip quite a bit that I've written down here just to summarize or maybe just give a, a few key considerations. I think one of the few things that we need to look at is infusing vetable trust in these platforms and demanding it as women because a lot of times we are the ones that are um, the victims. Um, looking at, I don't even, I don't like the word victim, but um, we'll work with that for now. Uh, looking at key players, um, being open to genuine collab collaboration and creating real avenues for bottom-up approaches. So having sessions like this with women from all sectors of life, um, with different qualifications, different experiences, then broad-based liter literacy programs and awareness, which I think Margaret and Baratang are doing quite excellently in, and then multidisciplinary professionals. So for instance, you know, they say, so I'm a 90s baby, and they say lawyers like myself are what we should be doing. I run a tech company, but I'm a digital lawyer. And understanding how platforms work helps you create tangible solutions. And then better enforcement, so that's training of our police officers, training of the law enforcement. But I think um, what's actually most important is what was mentioned by Margaret early on, starting in schools, making people understand their rights, but also their responsibilities to not be perpetrators <laughs> on online um, platforms. So I'll end by acknowledging Baratang for this little part of mine. Baratang is one of the women that um, I highly respect for one reason. She embodies um, the phrase, let's stop asking to get invited to the table and let's make our own. And I really thank you all for coming and sitting on her table today. So we are going to go to our next speaker. Thank you so much for your audience. Um, we're going to speak to uh, uh, Sophie Ngaza. Uh, Sophie, if you could please take the floor. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay, I am Sophie Ngaza from Cameroon. I am a member of ISOC Cameroon. I'm the founder of Digital Rights Coalition Cameroon. So I'm going to talk about tech innovation and justice, but I'll speak in French so that um, our friends who are French speakers can have the opportunity to have the message directly. It's not going to be very different from what the last speaker just said, just that I'll say it in my own words. Tech innovation to me is, um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sophie, um, just one second. Yeah. Uh, Binta, as most of us are English speakers, can you please translate in the process? Please. <laughs> okay. La technologie um, innovative pour moi, c'est l'information qui a été organisée dans une manière créative. C'est-à-dire, ça va pour créer les opportunités nouvelles pour tout le monde. Et c'est un principe que, que les, les gens doivent être traités d'une manière égale. <laughs> Is it OK? OK. <laughs> Donc les gens doivent bénéficier de, de ce qu'ils um, qu désèvent. Donc ça doit être égal. Même si ce n'est pas totalement égal, on doit faire tout et tout pour que les gens soient satisfaits C'est vrai que c'est difficile. La justice, la justice réfère à l'égalité. C'est aussi important pour tout le monde parce que euh, il y a différents groupes de personnes et ça se comprend dans plusieurs manières. Ça dépend de la situation et de ce qu'on est en train de faire. Il y a des gens qui comprennent la justice dans beaucoup d'autres façons. Par, euh, par exemple, la justice sociale, c'est la notion qui parle de l'égalité économique, les opportunités économiques. Mais quand on parle dans la justice environnementale, on parle, on regarde l'environnement et les bénéfices. Mais moi, je vais m'appuyer sur, je vais m'appuyer sur la justice technologie qui parle de le développement des de, 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 de applications technologiques et les processus pour les droits humains. Comment est-ce que les opportunités sont distribuées parmi les individus 
comment est-ce que les gens bénéficient d'une manière, d'une manière équitable Est-ce que tout le monde est égal en statut, en droit et en valeur Voilà les questions qu'on se pose. La technologie doit être basée sur l'accès aux infrastructures numériques. Je vais parler euh, du cas du Cameroun. En 2007, on a eu la coupure de l'Internet. Dans certains endroits au Cameroun, spécifiquement le nord-ouest et le sud-ouest, on a eu la coupure totale de l'Internet. C'était l'injustice. Les autres régions étaient connectées. Pourtant, on était dans une région, parce que moi j'étais là, dans ma région, on n'avait pas l'accès à la connexion Internet. Parce que le gouvernement disait que on utilise, euh, la, on utilise les réseaux sociaux d'une manière irresponsable. Donc ils ont décidé de supprimer les réseaux sociaux et, et beaucoup d'autres aspects sur l'Internet. On a trouvé ça comme l'injustice. Parce que dans tous les cas, même si, même si on a les crises, même si on a les problèmes, le gouvernement ne doit pas suspendre ou couper l'Internet dans certaines régions et laisser d'autres régions. Donc ça a causé plus de problèmes. Les problèmes d'injustice. Les gens se sont fâchés et ils ont pris ça comme un autre problème. Et ça a aggravé les problèmes qu'on a au Cameroun, qu'on appelle la crise anglophone. Qu'on qu continue toujours à expérimenter jusqu'à aujourd'hui. Donc, quand on parle de l'innovation, technologie et la justice, ça veut dire que on doit faire en sorte que tout le monde puisse bénéficier équitablement aux opportunités que l'innovation de la technologie amène à la population. Dans tous les cas, c'est vrai que c'est un peu difficile d'avoir l'égalité, mais it has to be fair. I don't know how to say fair in French. Juste. Hein? Juste. Ça doit être juste. <laughs> yeah, because just in French is justice, but there is fair, which has even no direct translation. <laughs> Donc, <laughs> équitable. Ok. Oui, ça doit, on doit partager ça équitablement pour que tout le monde puisse bénéficier dans toutes les régions. Je prends encore euh, l'exemple du Cameroun. Parce qu'on est en train d'expérimenter de, une crise, il y a les, les, les régions où l'accès a été réduit. Tu ne, peux pas, euh, tu ne peux pas envoyer une photo sur l'Internet. Ils ont fait en sorte que euh, ils choisissent ce que tu peux faire avec l'Internet. Après que ça peut causer euh, l'instabilité sociale. Parce qu'il y avait un moment au Cameroun où l'Internet était utilisé comme... comme comme quoi était utilisé comme euh, un outil pour la guerre. Oui, sur tous les réseaux sociaux, c'était grave au Cameroun. Mais toujours, on a trouvé ça comme l'injustice parce qu'on n'avait pas l'accès à la connexion. Donc, c'est pour dire que c'est mieux de, de partager euh, les avantages ou les opportunités technologiques d'une manière équipée pour que tout le monde puisse bénéficier, surtout les femmes. Parce que je suis une femme et je supporte beaucoup les femmes. Merci. Thank you. At least I know, merci. <laughs> Excuse me, I have a question. Can I ask a question? I'm here. On the right, left. Okay. Uh, is it online? No, I'm here. Oh, oh okay, go ahead. Yes. Actually, I'm going to ask um, a question for Sophie in French, so just excuse uh, me for uh, the French. I'm, like, I only heard merci. Is it possible someone can translate and then we all know what you guys are talking about? Yeah, she was talking about uh, Cameroon, US case in Cameroon, about like um, justice in Cameroon. So I'm just going to ask a question. Okay. Yeah, rel relatively to that. So. Um, can uh, what I'm trying to say is, before you ask a question, because now it's going to be a discussion between the two of you, can someone translate, Binta is there to translate, so that we're all on the same page, and then immediately after that you can ask a question. 
picture? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you switch on your mic, please? Fine, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, she said that uh, there is a problem of connectivity in Cameroon. The, the government <laughs> closes uh, the shut, shut down the internet in some in specific region in uh, Cameroon because uh, they said that uh, they use a lot of social media. So, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, she wants to be, to the to have more rights for women and justice and uh, equality of connectivity for all the the region. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. No, hello. We are go we are going to be totally confused. Can I be in charge of the meeting? Because at the moment, people are discussing, and I'm sitting here. Is it possible, Sophie? Do you wanna take the question that was coming that side, and then we close and move on to the other? Because time is against us. Yeah. Uh, alors, je te, I'm going to ask in French, if possible, yeah. So, je te remercie, uh, Sophie, pour, la, enfin, pour le discours que tu as fait. Uh, tu as pris, uh, en fait, un use case du Cameroun. Et, en fait, ma question sera concernant les femmes africaines. Comment, uh, en fait, quel genre de justice uh, tu conseilles les femmes africaines doivent adopter pour pouvoir avoir uh, plus de présence uh, sur les plateformes digitales Et aussi, um, what I noted Um, et aussi, autant que représentatrice de la femme africaine dans ce meeting, notamment la, le, le Cameroun, et pour moi, ce sera l'Algérie. Et comment tu conseilles, en fait, les, les, les représentatrices transmettre euh, ce genre de, de message et euh, d'initiative à leur euh, pays euh, natal Donc, euh, est-ce que tu as euh, des, euh, des conseils à, à transmettre pour, euh, voilà, à transmettre pour euh, par exemple, la communauté algérienne ou marocaine Je te remercie pour, euh, okay, merci pour le speech. Beaucoup. Merci. Euh, ce que je vais dire, c'est ce qu'on est en train de dire ici depuis la session. On a commencé... The question be translated first. Uh, I'm, I, look, I have a French-speaking person next to me. And she is from UNECA. I know he will do it. Easier job for me. Magda, can you translate the question for us, please? <laughs> Because I'm lost, okay, and I me, think half of the people let me should. Do it and then just answer it. Let me Before you answer, we need to hear the question. Because there's a lot of us. And half the room speaks. I want to say the question oh. in English. Oh, answer. oh, okay. That's better. Yes. Mm. So um, she's asking what I'm advising other women leaders, um, what they can do to to enable women to be present on the different platforms and um, what they can take um, out of this discussion to help women in other countries. So um, my answer will be that that's what we have been talking about in this session, the engagement of women. So I have to speak in French now. <laughs> Bon, c'est ce qu'on a dit euh, depuis la session-ci, l'engagement des femmes dans les activités de technologie. Par exemple, on a dit qu'il y a les appels pour les sessions euh, où on va parler de nos difficultés, où on aura l'opportunité de parler des choses qui nous dérangent, des choses qu'on veut arranger. Donc, quand on rentre dans nos communautés, il faut qu'on essaye à regrouper nos idées et à postuler, postuler pour les calls de call for proposals, c'est-à-dire que on essaye de postuler pour les sessions, les sessions qu'on peut parler de nos problèmes qu'on a face dans nos communautés. Et ta, ta première question était que qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire avec les femmes C'est de les sensibiliser, c'est de, de les éduquer, de les, de les entraîner à utiliser les outils informatiques. Si elles ne savent pas utiliser, si elles ne savent pas fabriquer, ça ne va pas aller. Et c'est pour ça que madame a même dit qu'elle peut faire qu'on descend aux enseignements des écoles primaires. On descend à la base pour éduquer les femmes, pour amener ces femmes à comprendre l'importance des technologies, comment développer ça. Parce que quand on aura un plus grand nombre de femmes qui seront engagées, on pourra donc s'asseoir sur la table comme ça et parler, parce qu'on va parler avec beaucoup de voix et on va dire une même chose. J'espère que j'ai euh, répondu à votre question. Euh, oui, ça répond. Merci.
Can I add thank, thank you very much. We, we're really running out of time. I think questions could be put on the chat, and Sophie will follow up with answers to whatever was raised. Um, I can see that Cameroon has raised very valid points and interesting facts. And um, you have your hand up, Binda? Me, me, me before. <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, okay, so very, very wait, fast. Wait, 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 Binta is our next speaker, so I'm assuming you're going to speak. Together, once and for all. Once and for all. Okay, thank you very much. So it's some very, very interesting conversations. Um, in what we're talking about in this session is about inclusion, mm. diversity. And unfortunately for us, it's not just about women. It's about, for example, when you talk about tech, it's about Francophone countries. They are very, very lacking behind. I'm fortunate to be working in a Francophone and an Anglophone country. I'm Nigerian, but I work in Niger, which is Francophone. We, have a digit we just launched a digital ambassadors program the question she's asking is, you see, there are very few resources for Francophone countries to empower themselves for tech innovation or whatever. There are more opportunities if you're from the Anglophone, English-speaking countries. And like she said, deliberate. Force yourself to be on the table. I love the closing remark which the lady about tech justice made before she left. Um, We've had to do a lot of language is a very powerful tool. It is very, very powerful tool because if you do not speak the language, you cannot assess the opportunities. There are so many opportunities on the internet, um, tech innovations, which it, it's incredible. It's incredible what women like us, uh, I'm so happy to acknowledge tech women. It's, we, we cannot do without mentioning that. That's what has brought some of us um, to this table. Baratang is uh, a powerhouse. I'm very proud of what she's doing with this. You see, it's very, very important that women from this points of disadvantage, like when we talk about justice, justice is a very, it's a compound word that can mean so many things. In Nigeria, we have tech bros. That's the definition of innovation. That's the, that's the definition of people. So even if you're a woman doing amazing things in the tech, you prefer to be referred as tech bros because the definition of somebody who is doing well in the tech world is a man. So brother, bros. So it's powerful. It's powerful. The gaps are so many. The gaps, even when you have a, a degree in tech, you have even uh, an, uh, so many gaps, so many gaps to stay in the place, so many gaps about uh, representation, so many gaps about opportunity, so many gaps about cultural context. So why is she doing this? Is this relevant? She wants to innovate for women's solutions and people think it's flimsy. But it's not flimsy. When you innovate for women problems, women challenges, you're innovating for 50% of the world. So it is not a flimsy problem. You're solving for a critical problem because you're solving for 4 billion people. So I'll stop my comment on this. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, ladies. Zanyu is going to wrap up on justice and technology. I do apologize. I did miss a good chunk of it, but I, I think as my as my colleague said, uh, we, we really came, um, come from the same angle when it comes to justice and technology. Uh, I think our problems are really the same. From a global perspective, we really have, um, you know, we, we're dealing with the same things. But I think in the same breath, it's very important to appreciate the local nuances that, that, that we go through, right? So for instance, in Cameroon, you were speaking about how um, social media platforms are really the method that people communicate the most. And if that's taken away um, from people, whether it's from a financial perspective, whether it's from um, you know, people being bullied or pushed off from cyber, cyber crimes or cyber harassment, that in itself creates a lower quality of life. That in itself goes against what innovation is, why technology was there in the first place. So I think that's really an excellent viewpoint coming from an African perspective, looking at the local issues on the ground, where it's not just about saying someone is doing something
nothing against the legislation per se, but they're going against, um, you know, whether it's a, whether it's a government, whether it's policies that are going against affordability and means for people to have that access. So I think that's quite important. Um, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that is a bit outlandish, um, but it's not. Uh, so I was at a session quite similar to this, and that's why it, I'm really like immensely proud to be here, where uh, we, the discussion is really around the same, the, the same issues. It was around what Facebook is doing, what Meta is doing, what big platforms are doing, um, who are responsible for bringing people together. Um, in instances where there is revenge porn, where there is social media-based harassment, where there is, um, uh, you know, a, a prejudicial behaviour, and what community rules they're putting in place, and one of the things that was mentioned is that we really ignore that this cyberspace has a real life effect. So one of the examples that they made was that in the Middle East, um, you know, because of how traditional the society is women end up getting um, killed um, in honor, honor crimes, because maybe a woman was shown, um, you know, on an image without you maybe wearing her hijab, or maybe she is uh, not from a, that traditional society, but she's shown near men and alcohol. You know, there might not even be an association with those two things, but she just happens to be in that image. And there have been instances where women have found themselves wanting where their own families have actually ostracized them. And I think a lot of the times we don't really think about those realities and think about how we should unite as women to not just speak about, you know, the legislation itself and the technology itself, but also speak about the social, the psychosocial elements that come with how we communicate, what we're putting forward as women, what we're tolerating as society and the evolution that comes with that, but also respecting people's cultures and traditions in all of that. So being able to have really candid, open conversations the same way that we're doing today. And I think it is really commendable that we can sit down together with all our different perspectives and talk about this openly. So I think for this session, I will close that there and I'll hand it back to Baratang to move on to or to rather introduce the next session. And thank you so much for your audience for this particular one. Can I ask a question? Um, if you can put the question on the chat, are you online? Uh, I'm not online. Okay, we'll take one question. I think it's fair. Yeah, I want to ask uh, the woman, I don't know your name, sorry. You, um, you talked about like the two languages, the Francophone people and um, the Anglophone people. So you had the chance to have uh, the two caps, the French and the English. So you had the transition from English to French, not French to English. So you talked about the importance, uh, the importance of the language for a digital inclusion. You talked also about the justice is to have have uh, an equal like right for anglophone and francophone we can't also like forget the arab people the people who are speaking uh, local languages so i need to ask you actually um can you mention any initiatives um, are currently happening uh, that are trying to include uh, non-Anglophone people, including like French and Arab people? So it will be so um, great to mention them and highlight them. Thank you. I'm here. Okay, um, it's so interesting that you're very interested in this topic. For us, what we did is uh, I'm lucky to be working in a part of uh, Nigeria and Niger where there is a common indigenous language spoken, which is Hausa language. Uh, Hausa is the most widely spoken in West Africa. So we found a way to bridge that gap because unfortunately for us, apart from the lack of uh, the French francophone resources, we also had um, a majority of the participants for the program. I don't know what's happening globally. I'm talking about my own intervention. So um, we had uh, women who were interested in tech, who could do TikTok videos, who had video, YouTube video channels, but uh, didn't, uh, didn't have skills. So we had to find a way to bring resource persons who could teach in indigenous language. So they taught tech skills, tech Microsoft Word, Microsoft uh, PowerPoint, Microsoft Corel Draw, Microsoft Excel in Hausa language. And I hope that we can still scale such initiatives. I hope I responded to your question. Um, I'm going to add on a response. 
what we're building an app that teaches South Africans because in South Africa we have 11 official languages. 80% of South Africans are not affluent English speakers. So we busy, I'm uh, part of the team that's building it to teach South Africans in their own mother tongue so that they can be part of the digital space. Now, sometimes we're talking about language. When we started, when Binta started, he said language is such an essence. Language can either make you or break you. Uh, in South Africa, it's worse because English was promoted as an educational language. So if you can't speak English, you know you are excluded immediately from tech. Now, you find that 80% of the people, it's not their mother tongue and they are not affluent in, t in it. Hence, they don't participate well in board meetings. They don't participate well in proposals, uh, policy issues. Now, with that said, is that we're also losing something that's very important. Our own stories as African are from one mouth to the other. I used to, my mother told me stories, my grandmother told me stories, her grandmother told her stories because it's how Africa is. But now I speak half English, half Tswana. So when I tell my children English, stories in my mother tongue, they translate it in English and they start questioning the context. They're not hearing the story and the history behind it. So for me, it's very important that as Africans, and I think the question you raised is very important, that languages, we need to preserve them. We need to have a portal, I don't know who's doing it, a portal where we'll keep history and stories and the only way we can do that is get to get people who are not digitally included to tell these stories so that we can include them in the digital space and have the media people interviewing these old people, especially the older generation, to get them to tell stories in a manner that it can make a business sense. You know, telling stories on TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, writing in Hollywood is the biggest money-making scheme. In Africa, if you tell a story, you are telling a story so that it's a generational story. When do we turn it into a Nollywood for the whole Africa? I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Africa. Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of everybody. So I think your question was very relevant and it touched something inside me. So I'm going to go to the next session. The next session is very different. It's how to anticipate technology trends, analyze and influence legislative development. Um, and it's followed by identifying business opportunities created by policy initiatives, regulations, and legislations. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Magta to open the session because he's the one who is really working in policy and seeing how women are responding to business opportunities that are created by policy and how he struggles to get women to respond. He might be the one to tell us, but I just want him to start the session. Um, included in the panel, it will be Sister Pritiva Daya and um, Sylvia Mukasa. And as I said, names, you will all speak in that other um, line. Thank you, Barata. I think uh, we, we had a very good discussion in the first panel, hmm? and that show how uh, ample human is important in the, in the continent. We have uh, several cases in, uh, in uh, Cameroon. I think it is a good example in the continent to see why government disconnect internet, as well as uh, several other examples. And, uh, you know, in, uh, for the language also, I think it is a big opportunity for women. And in Africa, we have around 2,000 to 200 languages. And using artificial intelligence, we can create a lot of opportunity and business uh, for, for women. Uh, of course, uh, it's this digital, econ digital technology offer uh, women uh, to access to the financial inclusion. We have, uh, we have the case of, uh, uh, of, of Kenya or m maybe almost of women have access to this, uh, to the financing banking, and also to create uh, valor added on your, and, and on their activity like what uh, Rwanda did, yeah, in the view of the private sector, women private sector. This digital also provide as an opportunity on the social inclusion in, uh, in several countries like what we have in Togo, what called no Novici, it is a one of, uh, a digital assistance uh, where a lot of women have been beneficiated during the COVID time. Yeah? I, uh, also, it is something we have to look at it. Uh, as an opportunity also on the te 
we, we, when we talk about uh, fin financial inclusion, we, there are a lot of fintech women now in, the, in, in Africa, and we need to build their capacity. Uh, one uh, activity, ongoing, one ongoing activity now at ECA, it is uh, a collaboration with uh, uh, Alibaba to build uh, the capacity of the startup uh, on fintech. And the objective is, is to build by, uh, we start, we are going to start 1st of January, and by end of January 2023, we, we expect to build 10,000 startup in fintech. And we think we are going to get more women on uh, this uh, capacity <coughs> building. It's free. The training will be in English and, and French. After we'll, uh, the team will give you a, a, the link to register for this capacity building. Also, there is something very important when you talk about uh, policy site. We need, uh, I, as I said at the beginning, we need to increase this gender mm -hmm. on all our policy. We have this African Digital Transformation Strategy. There is a gender parity on everywhere in this uh, digital internet transformation strategy. When we talk, because the uh, digital transformation has several pillars, there is a pillar on uh, education, on skill development, on industry, or private sector. Everywhere we have uh, this, this gender parity, increase this gender parity on this policy, because without this gender parity, we, this policy will not success. And why I think the, the discussion you are going to have is very important. We need to build the capacity, it's very important to build the capacity, such in the, in the local area, because we have a lot of problem in the, in the urban area we have, but of course uh, we have more problem in the rural area to find uh, to have the business community center to build the capacity of the of the woman in this area. Also, in, uh, in in the finance sector or activity sector, we need to develop policy to provide uh, incentive uh, uh, payment or incentive uh, in the fiscal sector to the woman to build their enterprise. It is very important <laughs> to empower new women also in the enterprise sector. On the industry also, we have uh, to find a way. Hmm? to make more women in the industrial sector, because we have several lack on the sector in, in the continent, and it is where we have a very, very few women in the industrial sector. We need to build their capacity to provide them with enough knowledge and enough skills to be part of this uh, uh, sector. And as a, where we have a lot of women now, it is in the artisanal sector and also in the informal sector. We need to build the capacity for this lady, uh, for the girl <laughs> and woman, to improve their, cap their, their productivity uh, using digital technology. We have uh, some example in, uh, in Guinea, eh, where, we where we support to the lady uh, working in uh, several areas in the informal sector. Then in their shop, uh, they have a restaurant, they have uh, uh, several kind of uh, uh, activity, and they use uh, digital technology to improve their, uh, their, their capacity, also their business. There are some uh, area of, ref of reflection during the next session where I think we can find a, a solution for, uh, for the African woman. But what is important also, we, we need uh, to hear the voice of women during the next uh, summit in 2024, summit of the future, and why we need to have uh, uh, the involvement of all uh, women in Africa in this uh, global digital compact. We already opened the consultation for the Global Digital Compact. I think you can uh, come up with uh, one recommendation or woman declaration for the Digital Compact we can put in the Digital Compact. As well as uh, if uh, it's not possible during this, uh, because it's very short, you have only 20, 20 minutes to discuss or 30 minutes, we can organize the next year, early next year, a meeting with only for the woman. Hmm? Yes. ECA will organize a meeting for I the... take that as a commitment. Yeah, this is a commitment. We can, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll organize uh, early bef before uh, March or March or before March or February uh, a meeting for women uh, to discuss about the global compact, digital global compact. How uh, you can w w the idea of women, and we can have a, a declaration of uh, African women for the digital compact. Thank you, and uh, good luck for your discussion. Um, thank you very much, Magda. I have taken two hours away from the whole IGF, like literally. I, I cannot thank Magda more than I can. 
what he did for me today is more than what I could ask for. And we will hold you up to the digital compact dis discussion next year. Thank you very much. I will set you free, and then our speakers will continue. You know, I just thought, the lady that's sitting next to me, she works, she wasn't on a program, but she works with digital media. I want to wrap up before those two ladies start, and I ask her if she can speak for two minutes, because it's very important. Five. It's very important to hear her voice and where she's coming from. Um, she was, I asked her to take notes today, which was a demeaning task. I should have asked the men to do it for me. Um, but I'm going to ask her to just speak about media monitoring, especially because we just came from justice and technology. And the points that they said didn't have the closing aspect of it. And with facts that Sister Janti had raised earlier on about women being powerful. So I think this is the right person to wrap it up. So Nom Shadow will take over. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was taken off guard, but I'll definitely Tell us where you are. Uh, do justice. My name is Nom Shato Lubisungosungulu. I'm the head of communications at Media Monitoring Africa. And I think um, what Baratang is speaking about is one of my passion areas. And I think it's also a discussion that is lacking still. And I'll, I'll basically divide this in two parts since I only have five minutes. And I want to speak about it from the internet perspective and the media perspective. In most instances, when we talk about, um, you know, women and media or women and the internet, we, we really lack to discuss about the lack of voice that they have. Um, at Media Monitoring Africa, we always find that women make up less than 30% of voice in the media itself. And I'm talking about access as experts, and this is on a global scale, on issues like climate change, for example. And this is on, um, you know, a continuous basis of yearly monitoring at the same time. But the second part which for me without intervention without innovation will continue to grow to become a threat and that is online violence against women and this has grown to become a very serious issue whereby you're seeing online harassment you're seeing online sexism you're seeing online attacks of women that are becoming a situation whereby it's coming online to offline as well and this is a voice a space whereby women were given and have been utilizing it from an activism point of view to echo their voices on issues of society to hold power to account at the same time. However, it's the very same voice where they are tried to be muted. They are taken below average as if their voices don't hold power. <coughs> and I think these are two issues that we really need to look upon from a perspective of policy, from a perspective of holding tech to account as well, from a, uh, from a point of view of protecting women online. Um, I think I'll hold it there, um, but thank you for the platform, Barata. <laughs> Hand over to Sister Pritiba. Oh, Sylvia Mukasa will speak first. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so my name is Sylvia Mukasa, and I'm happy to be part of this conversation, contributing to the topic how to anticipate technology trends, analyze, and influence legislative development. So the way I'll respond to this is all those elements, anticipation, analyzing, and influence will be in my responses in no particular order, right? Um, so one thing I believe we need to be doing is um, we need to understand what's happening in the technology space. <coughs> Without understanding what is happening, then we cannot act or respond to uh, what is going on or also predict and uh, be able to anticipate what is happening. So it's important for us to begin to inform ourselves as actors in this space <laughs> so that then we are making informed decisions on what the potential trends are and what we need to be doing. So I'll give some examples um, in terms of what is happening. So when we look at ICT as, um, you know, as a sector, there's a lot that is happening there. And... Um, the speakers that have gone before me have mentioned artificial intelligence. I think that is a word we are not going to run away from. Artificial intelligence is playing a very big role uh, in terms of what is happening globally. So just allow me to give you some statistics. So according to PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, the global AI study, um, <laughs> AI will contribute to 15.7 tr trillion US dollars to the global economy in 2030. And what does this tell us? 
it just tells us that we as Africans, for instance, need to be participating in what is happening around AI. Otherwise, everybody else will take the pie and will be left behind. So we need to be active players um, in terms of what is happening around artificial intelligence. The other statistic I'd like to share is that, according to the World Economic Forum, um, the, um, their global gender report 2018, only 22% of artificial intelligence professionals globally <laughs> are female, compared to 78% who are male. Of course, this accounts for the general gender gap of 72% that is yet to be closed. This finding is not only alarming in itself, but a stunning reminder of the urgent action needed by all stakeholders to mitigate the threat posed by gender bias outcomes in future AI applications. So we need to be very um, deliberate in terms of formulating policies and also building capacities around AI. Otherwise, women and girls are still going to be left behind in this very crucial technology. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to point out is that research has shown that, um, especially when we look at emerging technologies, that um, gender and race are crucial areas to look at. Um, so we've uh, come across uh, examples of uh, some solutions that do not work very well for women and um, for people of certain races. So as Africans, we need to be very um, deliberate also in being active players in what is happening in emerging tech. And I'll give an example. So sometimes you go to the bathroom and you're drying your hands and um, the dryer cannot detect your hands. Uh, it's just uh, pure, purely a color thing um, because when a certain race is dominant in the formulation or coming up with some of these solutions, it means another race is being left behind. So as Africans, we need to be very deliberate in being players in emerging technologies so we are not affected by this kind um, of issues. Uh, the other thing that I would like to point out is that data is very crucial and as these technologies are being adopted, then it means um, how data is consumed and used um, has to be um, conducted in a manner that um, is able to be inclusive as well and um, how the data is used um, is also in a manner that's not abusive. So policies around data and what is happening around data technologies is very important uh, for us. Um, and uh, the other thing I'd like to bring out is that uh, these new technologies um, are bringing about changes in terms of la labor dislocation and other market dis disruptions. And a good example here is the gig economy. Um, a lot has been said again about uh, the abuses that go on around uh, gig workers. And so as um, a continent and also at global level, what kind of policies are there in this very uh, important economy that is shaping how employment works and what kind of solutions and policies do we have around the gig economy? Uh, the other thing is um, making sure that inequalities are not exacerbated by these new technologies. And so we have to keep looking out for these trends and ensuring that um, we are addressing any gaps that are, identi are identified along the way. Um, and also uh, looking at data and how it plays out, uh, there's new risks to public safety and also national security. Um, so with, with um, data being available and um, so many different people collecting da data, we have to be very um, uh, careful and also be very deliberate in formulating regulations and policies that protect uh, individuals uh, with their data. Um, and uh, the other thing I'd like to, uh, to point out about the pace of innovation. So innovation is largely taking place beyond the purview of governments. And in many cases, the rate, uh, the rate of innovation is outpacing um, the, strat uh, the state's or national um, policies and regulations ability to, um, you know, to control uh, what's happening around these developments. And I'll give an example of M-Pesa in Kenya. So when M-Pesa um, came up, uh, the government of Kenya didn't really have uh, strong regulations around uh, mobile money. But with the adoption of M-Pesa, then the government had to start thinking around how do we uh, regulate this environment, and that has um, 
uh, enabled Kenya to move very uh, well around uh, the fintech space. And so what this tells us is that sometimes we um, governments or regulators will have to act either in a very reactive manner to how technology is moving, especially when um, we are outpaced by how quickly development is, is coming up. Uh, alternatively, if we can predict what's happening, then we start to come up with the regulations um, to control um, innovation um, in a manner that um, does not uh, exclude others or um, cause other harm. Um, the other thing I'd like to speak about, sorry. Okay. Um, the other thing I'd like to speak about is that um, there's a lot of uh, frameworks, dynamic frameworks already that govern um, some kinds of technology. Uh, giving an example of uh, cyberspace, which is already governed uh, by an amalgamation of existing international law, as well as an ever growing complicated array of political agreements, technical standards, and uh, protocols. So um, we need to also uh, think about how then do we um, ensure that we are, you know, we are actively uh, participating in formulating the right policies and regulations. And uh, with this, I'd like to just uh, come up or, or give you a few uh, points that sum up the kind of things that we'll be doing. So we need to identify uh, key principles and values. For instance, look at equity, look at equality, look at inclusivity, look at uh, responsibility, transparency, and accountability that might be impacted by certain technological advances. Um, and we need to protect those values. So if we are looking out at um, the new technologies that are coming out, we need to ensure that there are key principles and values that are maintained. Um, an example here would be the use of predictive algorithms, um, which then again, uh, we need to ensure that they do not exacerbate existing socioeconomic inequality. Um, and generally just thinking about how technology is designed and how it will be used is very key. The other point is uh, we need to engage stakeholders effectively. So legislators, regulators, private business leaders, researchers, uh, and civic actors need to be ready to respond more responsibly and effectively to the effects of um, uh, to, to the effects of the consequences of technological advances and also potential society, societal um, risks that they may pose. Thirdly, we need to broaden uh, existing platforms uh, of multilateral engagement. So various actors can contribute to the work of multilateral uh, mediums on how existing international law or political norms apply to the state use of certain technologies. And this would be, uh, for instance, through the UN groups of uh, government experts and also the formulation of specialized working groups on matters technology, including ICT, machine learning, uh, autonomous weapons, and others. Fourthly, I'm about to wrap up, um, craft suitable regulations, and this could be precautionary, preventive, or react reactive, or a combination of the three. Um, and finally, we need to enhance transparency, oversight, and accountability. And this, um, th this could be through national regulatory oversight bodies, which could be private, public, or both. And then technology companies and organizations must also accept scrutiny because um, sometimes they're self-reporting but really are not accountable to uh, the external forces. So this uh, needs to play out. And with this, I will end this and hand over to Pratima. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I think let's just take a moment to pause because we've been getting a lot of information. And uh, just, I'm going to invite you just to breathe a little bit and relax. <laughs> take a sip of water and just uh, settle down a little bit. A break. I think it's been a long run this afternoon. They must tell us who they are and where they come from. <laughs> if, if you can do that. Sure. Okay. 
Okay, so my name is Pratiba. I'm from South Africa. And um, thank you for this opportunity to share. Um, I'm going to share from a very different perspective. I think we've been speaking a lot about policies and technology and its impact on society, but I'm going to take it a little bit more on the personal level because I think one of our earlier speakers did allude to that technology impacts every aspect of our lives. It, it has come into our homes. It's no longer just an aspect that's discussed in corporates or in government level, but it impacts our individual lives. So I want to come from that perspective. If we look at the last few decades with the development of the internet and technology and the opportunities it affords us, there is much to be grateful for. It has made information accessible. It has made us in some ways able to connect um, with each other easier. Um, but we can all agree, and I think it's been iterated over and over again that um, we still have a long road to go because if we look at our impoverished communities and rural communities, um, we still have a long way to go to make sure that information is easily accessible, it's affordable, and there is sufficient know-how on how to use it effectively. Research shows that the wealth gap is increasing, and we can see that happening. Um, so while opportunity lies to make real improvements for overall development and upliftment of communities, there are challenges to ensure that benefits are equitable and far-reaching where most needed. The, in the internet and technology is an enabler. And I want to stress this because sometimes we forget that it's only a tool. It's not the objective. It's a tool for sustainable development. It is a tool for improving life. But it's not really the objective. And like any tool, it's how we use it that makes all the difference. Um, access to information has an amazing impact. Uh, it can make a difference, but we've also seen how access to misinformation can be so destructive as well. So just to put things into perspective, that it is a tool, it's not really um, the ultimate sort of solution. It's how we use this that can lead us to the solutions we need. So I think it's very important that in achieving our vision of an inclusive, develop-orientated, people-centered society, we place a high priority on learning and education that is not only functional and practical and relevant in content, but which also has spiritual and moral principles and values at its heart and the overall development of the whole person and society at its aim. Without considering the values that are important, um, that very tool can create harm. And so really to bring about the kind of progress we need, we need to always check back and align back to the values uh, that are important. It is important that we reflect on some of the trends that we are seeing. And we are beginning to see within our homes, within our communities, that there's a growing materialism and individualism. And I'm particularly going to talk with a more sort of focus a little bit on young people because they generally are the ones who have really um, um, tend to live in this virtual world of social media where the self is a virtual persona and the allure of popularity and virtual <coughs> success can put tremendous pressure on them to project unrealistic images of themselves 
which they compare with others constantly. So this phenomena of social comparison is when you tend to assess your own value and in, in relation to the attractiveness, the wealth and success of others, this can lead to quite severe mental health issues. You know, research shows that um, um, that when there is this kind of overuse and addiction to the likes <laughs> in your social media platforms, um, it can create and can lead to impact on depression and anxiety, um, suicidal thoughts, because if you don't get the popularity you're seeking for, then it can create these issues. So where there isn't a deep sense of self-worth, an individual and especially young girls become vulnerable to getting addicted to this virtual world. And her emotions are easily influenced by public opinions and comments, which can have devastating effects. Studies have shown that this addiction to social media has effects on concentration span, distancing oneself from the real world and from family relationships. You have more virtual friends than real friends. <laughs> and an inability to have meaningful relationships, which show that there's an inability to show empathy, leading to anxiety, depression, and isolation. This has also led to cyberbullying, higher suicide rates, and an increase in women and girls being trafficked. So technology is a tool, and how we use it is vitally important. Unless the individual has a strong foundation of spiritual principles and values that would define choices, and guide the use of devices and apps, they are all too vulnerable to getting addicted and misled in the cyber world. So I want to quote a few examples, and I think it's important just to um, take note of it. Uh, one example is of an article in the Wall Street Journal of the 14th of September, 2021, which showed that Instagram had done some research, and they had, their research had revealed that um, they have quite a negative impact on young girls um, because it's all very image orientated, and um, and yet the question is they never revealed this research, and number two, what did they do as a result of knowing this? because the way they uh, market themselves in a way, it is to draw uh, and, uh, the attention and draw the market of young girls. So that's one example that we have to bring to account technology companies as well. That we can't, you know, don't just look at people as a market for profit but we have to bring in certain values into how we use technology and how we promote that technology. We have a social responsibility to, to also that. Um, and yet there are good examples as well. Um, Dove had a lovely um, campaign where, you know, most of the images that you see on social media are not real. People take their photographs and Photoshop it. And Photoshop is not real. It's not possible to look like that. Uh, so Dove had a campaign to actually um, reverse that, uh, to encourage uh, in a way that um, have a bigger dream and who you are is good. So I'm just getting to try to show that we have to look at the education of the individual, and especially for our, our young girls. They're the future, and um, they're the future leaders as well. And so the importance of creating a very strong foundation of self-worth is important. Self-worth that's based on reality, okay? 
So um, the next aspect I just want to bring in through is that independent thinking, innovation, and creativity are always welcomed. However, in the growing complexity of issues we see in the world, it is also valuable that we give time to reflect on some critical values to create a new way of leading that is inclusive, <coughs> collaborative, and compassionate. And I feel women, we can actually pioneer that. Uh, the digital platform offers us an opportunity where we can bring together our <coughs> skills, our specialities, our talents, um, but more so our hearts. Um, because I think women have a, a greater tendency to show compassion and care and willing to share the platform, um, to share the leadership. I think going forward, our world is very complex and solutions that cannot be found by one, but it's our co-creative thinking together that can create solutions going forward. So that is one aspect that I feel that we have an opportunity to pioneer the way forward. Um, and I think part of being able to create this process um, as part of an a, a international group of women, um, we've actually created a program um, of just creating an online space where women can have a safe space to come together from different parts of the world to share our experiences, to share our insights, to learn from each other's experiences, and to co-create a process of leadership development. Because I think that's how we're going to move forward and in a way that we need everyone's voice, everyone's thinking, um, and we can learn from each other's lessons as well. Um, and so this collaborative process of learning and seeing what can emerge when we come together. Um, many of us have had the experiences that when women come together, magic happens, right? <laughs> uh, but I'm sure when you thought of this forum, it magic happened because you just got the right group of women together. And I think that's it. Um, because we're not afraid to share the space together and we can easily learn from each other. So I think that's the way forward. So um, just in, in conclusion, I would like to say that um, as Brahma Kumaris, we have been offering to people of all walks of life around the world, a very simple, accessible, and yet effective education in self-awareness. Because only when we become self-aware can we begin to impact our world around us. Um, self-awareness, spiritual principles and values. Information, policies, and strategies are important. But our challenge is always how we implement them. And so um, now we must reflect through the prism of spirituality so as to give it the light of wisdom by which we may lead our lives as one human family. For it is only when we change our inner world that the outer world changes. And so I think in essence that's what I would like to share, that as much as we think of the frameworks around us, um, real transformation and change comes when we begin to personalize it within and then begin to impact our outer world. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, thank you very much, Sister Pritiba. I just want to make it very um, real and tangible for some people because sometimes we talk too much policies. How the session is about how do you take policies, how do you look at it, and create an opportunity and business out of it. So I've got, I know I put her on the spot, because I, the talks weren't touching me. You know, I'm a business person. If you, tell, if you talk to me and I can't make sense of where's the opportunity and how to approach it, I still hasn't, haven't heard you. So I ask Justina Mushiba, the CEO of Universal Communication Access Fund in Tanzania, 
to just make it tangible for us, for those women who are here and they want to enter the space and they don't know how to. Because IGF is going to finish and we're going to go back to our life. We don't want to make it a one-week activity. We already have one tangible result from UNECA. Uh, we discuss in the Global Digital Compact next year in March as women. And then we just want to hear what business opportunities are there. And um, because you'll be leading to Wisdom and Zanyue. I like be calling people by first names. It's a weakness. I must fix it. Uh, we'll ask Wisdom and Zanyue to close on what you would have said because they work in the space. Thank you very much, Batarang, for giving me this opportunity. It's my first IGF in, here in Addis, and my ever first IGF in whatever it started. Mm -hmm. So I was just uh, very keen listening to everything that, that is going on, and congratulations, you ladies. You are doing an amazing job, and uh, as a, a Baratang said, I'm working with the government. I'm the CEO of the Universal Service Access Fund. I'm a lawyer by profession, so I have a learned sister. Um, what I can say, there's a lot of business opportunities in, uh, in, in government, but uh, for whatever opportunity that is available, you should go forward uh, looking for that opportunity. Um, we are doing the rollout of uh, communication services and internet and school connectivity in villages. That is my main uh, job and uh, activity that I'm doing with the government. So there's a lot of uh, need for partnership. And uh, you know, when I work with women, I'm more comfortable. Sorry for men inside, eh? <laughs> but I feel more comfortable. You know, once you, you, you're dealing with a woman, you know, it is not a, a secret, it's a fact. We are very loyal, you know, you, we, we, we are scared, we have families, we have everything. So whatever a woman come to me and approach, I have a project that I want to do, I'll be very comfortable to, 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 to work with a woman more than a man. Sorry to say that, but it, that's, it is what it is. Um, so in uh, rolling out or doing a school connectivity, uh, we are we are in need of uh, collaboration between private sector and the government because the government by itself, there's no way we can do it alone. We need somebody to come there and help us in whatever that we are doing. But the thing is, um, in many occasions, when, for instance, maybe we advertise some tenders, uh, you don't see a lot of women coming forward. And we know that we have brains in, 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 in women. but. Sometimes they, they are not, you know, ready to come forward for business opportunities. We have a lot of business opportunities, but we don't see uh, women coming forward. So I think it is a time now. For instance, even the government is trying to make a, a certain maybe a consultation. Maybe they want to enact a, a, a law or whatever. We do a consultation. And for that consultation, we are collecting some views from different, you know, stakeholders. But once the women are not there, our agendas, our need, our thinking won't be incorporated in, in the, 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 the thing that the government want to implement. So my, my, my humble request for us women, we should really make sure that we come forward wherever there is business opportunity. There is a lot, a lot of business opportunities. And it is not even in my organization, like in a whole government, for instance, in Tanzania. Once a woman go uh, in front, like everyone had that, you know, believe in as ladies. For instance, in my country now, we have a lady president. Like everyone is happy and we feel like we have a, a mother who can, you know, listen and do everything that women, women can, 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 can acquire at the certain time. So my humble request for us women, uh, we should really uh, go forward. Many opportunities are available for women and we should, oh, all right, I can talk like a politician. So once again, thank you very much for an opportunity. And uh, I think this is my first time and I'll be attending this forum uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Um, honestly, we, we had such insightful sessions. So what we're going to do is we're going to briefly go to the last one. I know 
a lot of you are tired and it's a overstimulation, but I think it's good information. A lot of the times we stimulate ourselves with the wrong things. So let's um, let's go into our last topic, which is identifying business opportunities created by policy um, initiatives, regulation, and legislation. Um, I'm going to invite my my colleague Wisdom to speak after. I'm going to briefly start um, and and. Pardon me? Okay, we will keep it short. Our boss has told us. She's instructed us. So um, I think really I will start with from an angle of looking at the gig economy and I'll try to be as brief as possible. I think we, 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 we can all acknowledge that the high unemployment rate in Africa affects, the, or rather the high unemployment rate not just here in Ethiopia but the entire landmass affects us all. Right, and we look at this as a, a pertinent point to solve, and the gig economy has come as a tangible solution to 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 to, you know, look at this problem. So we look at it really now as more an informal sector-based but um, um, resilient method. Um, but unproductive. So it's resilient, it's really bringing people in, but it's unproductive from the sense that um, if you look at taxation me measures, um, it really isn't a big contributor to taxation right now because we're speaking about e-taxation, we're speaking about a whole lot of missing gaps when it comes to legislation, regulation, and policy from creating that productivity um, from a GDP perspective. But then we also look at um, the fact that, you know, that it does have a big space for formalization. Um, and that, you know, already African people, we are already in the gay economy. So we have to sort of collaborate and sit down together to see how we can make that work, whether we have special taxes for the gig economy or whether we say to ourselves, um, um, you know, we'll do it a, a different way. But it just needs that discourse to happen and to happen intentionally. Then we speak about um, how... Uh, these opportunities really, if you look at that whole formal versus informal, well, from a technology perspective, women happen to find themselves in the more informal base sectors, which is a real problem because if we have to be honest with ourselves, when we speak about formalization of the gig economy or digital based work, um, you know, we're saying to ourselves that men should get more because the formalization typically comes with protection mechanisms, it typically comes with labor, labor law based mechanisms, it typically comes with places for reform. So um, really, if we, if we speak about this, at least from, from my inputs, um, a lot of us are sitting here from different angles of the digital world. Private-public partnerships are the only way that we can assist in overcoming solvable conundrums in Africa through the gig economy, through data utilization, I think, as, as you had mentioned, and through hardware, of, um, hardware and affordability of that hardware, and ensuring that we're progressively tackling, um, uh, you know, entrance and formalization, and I think also, as Magda said, getting women into startups, getting women into creating real, tangible money. We want to hear billionaires sitting with us here. Um, you know, we want to hear those stories because we're women, we're capable, and we can do it. I can see that I'm being told that I'm long. Um, <laughs> so just from our brief interactions, I really do think we're sitting with a great crowd, and... Um, we spoke about a thousand girls around, ten thousand girls being impacted around Africa. These are the tangible things that we're going to talk about. When ECA, when UNICA says that they're going to contribute to that, sitting here, the power of every single woman in here, your energy, you saying, "I want to hear tangible solutions," speaks to getting that signature, speaks to getting those commitments. So I think you know, it's, we can say congratulations to Baratang, but I think each one of you need to pat yourselves on the back to know that you have actually contributed to creating traction and creating possibilities in the platform for women in the digital economy. 10,000 girls can affect another, another 10,000 girls. I'm not great at math, I'm a lawyer, but that's a big number. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to open up the floor to my colleague, wis uh, colleague Wisdom. Um, I know that this is also an area of special uh, specialty, just like myself, um, so we do a bit of consultancy for companies that are looking into, you know, really formalizing the, the, the gig economy. But outside of that, looking at regulation, um, advocacy for policy, looking at getting people's real life experiences and seeing what are pra practical measures to get um, the solutions to the issues that we've come here for today. So, Wisdom, the floor is all yours. Um, Wisdom, please stick to three minutes or not more than five. I disagree. I'm sorry to do this to you, but... As okay, I guess. Um, my name is uh, Wisdom Donko. I'm the Executive Director for Africa Open Data and Internet Research Foundation and also 
uh, a task force member. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I've been listening, and then uh, I'm, I'll, I'll try to go uh, into our homes and then uh, see what exactly happens uh, in our homes, and then we try to relate it to what we are discussing. But before that, um, we have a complex uh, situation in Africa that we all need to uh, start thinking about. And then uh, that, that problem is uh, the availability of data. So the more we have data, the more uh, we are able to solve uh, our problem. So the first one is um, we have uh, huge data gaps uh, within our continent. We need to look at it and then uh, address that. And also our data processes uh, are not uh, right. We need to have a data roadmap, uh, a clear data roadmap, uh, a very a clear defined data roadmap. Uh, that should help us uh, solve our problems. And also, we also need to um, begin to um, encourage uh, data use. We don't use data. We just talk uh, out of the air. And then what we do, we don't back it with data. If you take our educational sector, it's a typical example. Our children go to school, especially the universities in Africa. Those that come out, all the projects that are due, most of them are not backed by data. So you realize that it's difficult for us to solve our problems. So we need to encourage that. And then uh, also uh, the data ecosystem, we need to look at that and, and, and start collaborating uh, in, in, so that we can all solve our problem. There's one other problem that we need to uh, look at. Uh, let's say in the African context, uh, where you have uh, a, a home of uh, a husband and a wife with, let's say, children. Uh, example, you have a daughter and a son, and then in the home, the, there is a defined uh, role for the girl to be doing. And most often, we normally think the girl should be washing the dishes and doing the kitchen work and all that. And then the, the son should be doing all the, the hardware, the technical things and, and all that. So we, we need to start the education from our homes if we want to solve uh, this our problem of uh, gender gap. Um, I don't agree that we should uh, give the opportunity to, more opportunities to um, the female. But what I think is that we should give the equal opportunity to both the son and then the daughter. And then when they grow up, they'll work together and then they'll grow together. That is what I think. If we encourage more of the female, and then you are leaving the male behind, the male will always, will, will always find a way out uh, in treating the female. So we need to encourage the two. The same women, uh, they give birth to what we, the men, and then the, 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 the daughter. So I don't see the reason why we should be preaching female, and, and although I understand there is a gap, by bridging that gap, we need to give an equal opportunity to both of them, and then try to help the both to grow up and then work together in harmony. And then if they are working together in harmony, we will have a, a very good home, and then uh, Africa will be a, a very uh, a sweet place uh, for, for us all. And uh, I'll, I'll be short. Now, the, another problem that uh, we face in Africa, uh, if you look at our employment sector, I'll finish, I'll finish. If you look at our employment sector, our great sector seems to employ uh, the largest. And then most of the labor force within this sector is women. And then most of these women live in the rural communities. And then in these rural communities, um, that is where they deprive is. You see, the, the activities that they do there is mostly farming. A man and a woman goes to farm, they come back. There is no source of entertainment. The only source of entertainment is what? In the bedroom. That is the only source of entertainment. And then 
what happens, there will be more production of our children. And if there is more production of children, the poverty will increase. So we need to be looking at that and then trying to look at the policies that we we'll take to them to address it. And then one of it is what the community network that we are all talking about. If they have those community networks and then they are able to leverage on those networks in finding uh, customers to even come and buy their farm produce, we'll be solving a problem. So I think, for me, I think those are the areas where the problems are, and we need to be getting to those areas in solving the, the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wisdom. So I will hand over to Anya from UN Secretariat to close uh, the session, but I'll have the little final word. <laughs> Like you were, Marathon, kindly doing with other speakers, please also interrupt me where I need to stop, because I can also speak um, quite long. <laughs> That's not my skill. But thank you so much. I uh, listened mostly to the first part. I did miss, I have to admit, the central part, but I plan certainly to catch up with everything and with great attention to listen to the middle part of the discussion that I couldn't be here for. Uh, for me, as I said at the beginning, it's a great honor to be in a room with such an inspiring group of people, uh, women who are leaders uh, in their communities on many digital-related uh, aspects, but also of, uh, as somebody said at the beginning, many men as well who joined this uh, session to support women and female leadership and empowerment in the internet governance arena. I think um, nothing speaks better about the um, stability of this ecosystem as this session, where we have women supporting women, but also men supporting women to women partnerships and cooperation. And that really, I think, gives us all confidence that our future in respect to digital inclusion of women and girls is bright compared to the past that unfortunately is not, or even the present, that is not in that sense that, that bright. Uh, very quickly, I know, Baratang, you have to close. Um, I spoke to Baratang, and maybe it makes sense to uh, finalize this session with a couple of processes that are around us, and which I think you can definitely enrich with your expertise, uh, especially bringing good practices uh, from your respective communities. They relate to the processes that are mostly with the United Nations. Um, but certainly, I think that there is a great value also in local processes. And I know some, some were mentioned during um, this session here but I will focus on those that are with the United Nations. The first and foremost, uh, I'll start from something that I think is a result and, and the cause why we are all here before I come to something that's more recent. And that's the, the processes related to World Summit on the Information Society. So it goes without saying, I don't need to repeat that, that the IGF is, uh, exists because of those processes. It was one of the major outcomes of VISA's processes. And Periodically, there are reviews of those processes, complex documents which were given to us, uh, stakeholders coming from different backgrounds, different countries and regions, to work on and to drive certain processes, are coming to a point where we will be asked what did we or what have we done so far, what we haven't done so far, what we need to do in the future. One of those uh, review processes comes uh, very soon in 2025. That's the Vestas Plus 20 review process. And that's where everything that we, we have been doing for in the past two decades will be subject for public consultations among all stakeholders. And then it will go certainly to the member states to understand how the, um, uh, the World Summit on the Information Society agenda and the program uh, progressed in the past 20 years. And I want to remind very quickly on some of the wording from the Tunis Agenda for the Information Society, which, as you know, also um, its paragraph 72 gives um, mandate to the IGF. The concepts of gender or women inclusion at that time were very much central to that important document. And that means that all those stakeholders that committed to work to achieve the VISA section lines and VISA objectives uh, we're working for, um, among other things, to include women, to include girls, to ensure the gender equality and equity in the online domain. 
And uh, one of the one of the requirements and one of the goals that were actually set in the document was to develop the so-called ICT indicators for developing very specific gender disaggregated indicators to, men to measure the digital divide in its various dimensions. And if you look today, uh, there are different practices in how digital divide is being measured. Uh, and I think uh, it's certainly food for thought whether we need more consistency in terms of what kind of indicators we use just to make sure that we actually speak against concrete exact data. So concrete exact numbers and concrete exact contexts in terms of what is a problem with gender-based digital divide in particular countries and regions. Because if there's one thing that I've learned in my work with the national and regional IGFs, that's the fact that the internet governance related issues and applies to this domain as well, are very much different across <coughs> countries and regions. So what may be a cause for gender-based digital divide or lack of inclusion of women and girls <coughs> in online domain for example, in, in one country or in Southern Africa, doesn't have to be necessarily a co cause in northern parts of Africa. And I, said, I think that's very important to, to speak about the indicators, about the criteria, I, and sorry, about the Anna, we have We have to vacate the venue in the next coming three minutes. And I am done in one minute. Okay. I just, so that's the versus. Versus plus 20. So please do uh, keep an eye on the processes and the calls that will come from the United Nations in terms of how to approach versus plus 20. The IGF Secretariat already strategically approaches that point by raising awareness, first of all, on what versus gave us as a homework, what we have done so far, and what we need to do by 2025 in order to ensure that everyone who will be listening to us are aware of the good work that happened. Another process uh, that uh, is m probably close to you as well is um, something that's more recent, certainly, uh, than the VESES. That's the Global Digital Compact. It came out of the, uh, out of the Secretary General's Our Common Agenda report. Basically, it's a concept that calls for developing common values on a couple of uh, important areas um, to tackle, such as connectivity, such as human rights, internet fragmentation, privacy, um, data governance and data privacy, uh, all the way to uh, content online, um, governance or regulation, uh, matters of digital cooperation, internet fragmentation, and so on. The consultations for that process are underway, and the idea would be that next year, in 2023, at the Summit of the Future, the Digital Global Compact is agreed. Uh, we will see how that process on the agreement will go, but it is important to respond to something that tomorrow may be something that uh, will orient our work in terms of values and principles. And that's, I'm sure you will all agree, most important. Before all the hard law, before all the policies that come, the framework of values is extremely important because it orients everything that thank you comes very much and thank you Bharatan. i think i think that calls for the for us to have the women in igf summit in japan <laughs> maybe we can finish the discussions there <laughs> um thank you very much for everyone i had the last word and i kept this because i didn't want to distract our program but i'm going to read a statement as my last word and everyone every woman sitting here if you do not do anything about that you hold it to yourself and the universe. And um, is that peace is not settling in Iraq. 1,500 women, young girls, were arrested for protesting for their rights. And you know what happens to them when they go to jail? In certain countries, before you get uh, whatever they call it. I don't want to use words that are going to traumatize me in the process. Before you get sentenced, you have to be raped so that you do not enter heaven. It's part of the belief system. Guys, we have to participate on the global compact of the digital rights. The platform is the only place where we can know about things that are happening to women in countries that had no voice in the past. In South Africa, I can go on now. The ministers video has been floating a very old woman on social media people rec some men young men recorded himself having sex with that woman and the whole country watched her those things happen to women only the person who recorded her didn't get any reprimand the country did nothing we have a advocate here who talked about cyber rights and all those intelligent things but women are still oppressed guys 
I don't do this because I want to. Every time I say women, it's because every day when I go to bed, I read a newspaper and I ask myself, which world do we live in? Thank you. Uh, we have to be out of this venue in one minute.